Did you think I was done? No, 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 no. See, we're done with Frontier. But Frontier isn't the only Monster Hunter game you've probably never played. Filled with monsters you've probably never fought. So that means I still got work to do. And this time, we are moving on to Monster Hunter Online, a Chinese exclusive Monster Hunter MMO made by the company Tencent in collaboration with Capcom. Online's another game that is officially defunct and has fallen into the more obscure side of Monster Hunter's history, even by the standards of these kinds of videos. And unfortunately, I don't think we'll be seeing much of anything regarding this game maybe ever again. From what I could find, in 2019, Capcom did not renew its agreement with Tencent, disallowing Tencent from using anything belonging to the Monster Hunter IP, which was the majority of what online had to offer. Not having nearly enough content that could be legally used, online was shut down, and as far as I'm aware, the monsters unique to Monster Hunter Online are still owned by Tencent, not Capcom. So unless these guys show up in a non-Monster Hunter game created by Tencent, I, I don't think they're gonna resurface. Just stranger things have happened, but I don't know, I'm not gonna hold my breath. And honestly, it's pretty unfortunate. Looking at online, it seemed to have a couple of pretty neat ideas and a fair amount of charm to it. It was the first time Monster Hunter had damage numbers, as well as stuff like layered armor and weapons. Weapons had unique attacks not found in other Monster Hunter games. Online had a ton of wholly original maps and music. There was MMO-inspired additions to the UI, like ability and item hotbars, and hunting parties beyond four players for some of the large siege battles. Crazy to think, right, that a Monster Hunter spin-off MMO not made by Capcom wound up introducing a couple of ideas that we got really accustomed to in the fifth generation of the games. And all of this was powered by the CryEngine, making it a game of far higher graphical fidelity than any of the mainline Monster Hunter games being made at the time, which were mostly still launching on the 3DS. It was even a second home for a lot of Frontiers monsters, actually, both MMOs housing their own versions of some of Monster Hunter's wildest creations. Kinda sucks that online will probably only slip further and further into obscurity as time goes on. Even after being around for six years, I get the impression that it had a bit more to give, and from what I've seen, the general opinion of those who played it is somewhat positive. It seemed to have its own quirks and issues, some glitches and some animation jank and bit too much of a reliance on a pay-to-play cash shop, but the gameplay itself seems to be fairly well received. Some of the monsters seem to be pretty well liked. Now, does that make this video pointless? Nah, talking about Monster Hunter Monsters is still a ton of fun. Delving into and learning about these obscure creatures on Monster Hunter's fringes has been an amazing undertaking, and preserving the memory of these creatures is a job worth doing. Also, you guys love watching these videos, and I love making them. I will still be rating each of these monsters from 1 to 10 by how much I'd like to see them reappear in Mainline Monster Hunter, even if I don't believe that that's ever going to happen. We got some good ones today. Online's got that good old-fashioned Monster Hunter blend of absurd, badass, and grounded, all packed in a pretty small ensemble of original monsters, and yet I'd say they cover a lot of the major bases that you come to expect with the creature design in this game. We actually have way more monster variations to cover, which, as always, Always will be covered in the back chunk of this video. So, without further ado, we have some monsters to document and discuss. Let's get going. Caesar Burr. Right off the bat, a beaver's a pretty neat idea for a monster hunter monster. Though, if I may be a bit reductive, Caesar Burr is kinda just a big beaver. I, I say kind of. Caesar Burr is a bit more built for combat and aggression than the typically more mild-mannered semi-aquatic rodents we see in real life. Caesar Burr 
is a fanged beast the size of a car with massive tree chopping teeth, long razor sharp claws, a flat heavy tail, and a fair amount of heft to him. All effective weapons it uses in gathering wood, food, and defending his territory. Like beavers, Caesar Burr constructs dams within lakes and rivers using downed trees, and he's typically found within dense forests that have bodies of water nearby. Like beavers, Caesar Burr is semi aquatic, able to be seen fleeing certain areas via leaping into water when it's accessible. As far as I'm aware, there's no visual for a Caesar Bird Dam or Lodge in Monster Hunter Online, which, eh, that's kind of unfortunate, I'd love to see one. Uh, would Caesar Bird dam up larger rivers with the larger trees it can knock down and carry? Uh, how big do those dams get? What kind of animals is he trying to protect himself from with said dam? There's a couple of cool questions you could ask due to the massive size increase between a typical beaver and a Caesar Bird. Combat-wise, I'd say Caesar Burr is most comparable to a Kongalala, while still having a solid amount of unique animations to call his own. It does a lot of the same things, but in somewhat different ways. Caesar Burr is mainly looking to crush you to death. He puts his full weight into a lot of his attacks. He's got barrel rolls, body slams, and forward-facing dives. My absolute favorite attack of his is when he does a handstand following up with a forward roll. He's also got Kongalala's claw swipe. He's got a bit of damage from a range, though he lacks any elemental projectiles. His large flat tail and forelimbs are each strong enough to rip up the earth and launch large clumps of mud, and I notice that he often likes to fire off mud in both of these attacks back to back. And if he needs to, he can pull up entire tree trunks out of the ground to swing around as a weapon, though he can pretty easily knock himself off balance due to the sheer force of the log swinging around. It's not the deepest move pool, but I think that can be forgiven for entry-level monsters. And for what it's worth, Caesar Burr has a lot of attacks and animations that he does call his own. In terms of his design, I really like him. He's super simple, grounded, and easy to figure out. He's clearly a beaver, reimagined to fit the monkey skeleton for the fanged beasts, thus making him a lot leaner and more muscular and having much longer limbs in relative proportion to his body than a actual beaver would have. I think it's pretty cool to see this skeleton reinterpreted for new types of mammals. And a beaver is a pretty creative choice that's executed kind of well. He's got a good amount of color in him too, which helps him pop out a little bit more, with none of the colors being too vibrant so they don't clash a ton. I like the yellow streaks in the fur, which brighten up his main body a little bit, and that kind of blue-purple tint on his hands, feet, belly, crest, and tail prevent those chunks of his body from just being like a dull, lifeless gray. And the little bits of beige on his tail spikes, crest, and belly, and claw spikes, those are nice touch too, just kind of lets those bits pop. There's a fair bit to the design here without him feeling busy or overcomplicated. It's it's simple and has a bit of its own flair and I think he looks pretty good. I like this guy. I think his design and some of his unique animations are my favorite things about him. He's not terribly complex in terms of his ecology, design, or combat. I do like the occasional super grounded, super realistic monster under monster that could you know, feasibly be a real animal. You know, I could totally see Caesar Burr being an animal that walked on this planet at some point, minus uh, the handstand rolling and the tree swinging. That's definitely the monster hunter influence. It's pretty cool to see the traditionally monkey-oriented body type repurposed for a gigantic rodent. It's a shame Caesar Burr's probably gone for good, because I'd love to see one just kind of passively carrying logs around and knocking down trees, maybe creating a big dam somewhere. Especially as these Monster Hunter games are starting to get a little bit more ecologically inclined. The only thing I can really say against him is that he might just be a shred too simple. Uh, he looks like a beaver. He does things like a beaver. It has beaver ecology. And yeah, that's that's kind of it. I'm going to give good old Caesar Burr an 8 for how much I'd like to see him in Mainline Monster Hunter. Freymine. So, Gypsaros is far, far, far from being the most beloved monster in Monster Hunter's bestiary. So, how does his violence-craving explodey cousin from online pan out? Oddly enough, I, uh, I like this one too. 
Craymine is a desert-dwelling psycho of a bird wyvern, sporting a more heavily armored body, a striking red head of hair, weaker wings, and much more powerful legs. He lacks his more famous cousin's rubbery, electricity-resilient hide, blinding head crest, ability to steal items, proclivity towards playing possum, strong wings, and poison-producing organs. However, he compensates for these lacking qualities with a much more physically powerful body, a louder and more ear-piercing cry, and a projectile weapon of his own, that being an explosive mucus he can spit up in great quantities, and in a variety of methods. He does get to keep the elastic -y tail, though. The explosive thunder oil, as the mucus is called, is Kramine's most potent and commonly utilized weapon. It is incredibly lethal, highly volatile, and easily manipulatable. Kramine can spit up globs of this mucus in several spread out shots, fire it off while running, follow up spinning physical attacks by arcing the mucus into the air, and cough it up into the sand beneath his and your feet, causing subterranean detonations. He can beat his wings in order to create wind currents that can push the mucus across the sand. Some property of the thunder oil causes it to detonate almost immediately on contact with sand, and it seems he can also detonate it by screeching. So this stuff is enormously unstable and can burst with even the slightest stimuli. His bite can even have a bit of an explosive kick to it. Fight-wise, this is where he differentiates from Gipsaros the most. The two share a lot of physical attacks, so Gipsaros's flying hops, elastic tail sweeps and smacks, his bite attacks, and his charges are here. The big changes are the elemental powers being put on display, and the attacks through which they are expelled. And personally, though this again does not look to be the most complex duel out there, I think Kraymine is a pretty neat take on a Gipsaros relative. And of course, I think he can be forgiven for not having the deepest move pool as an early game monster. And for for an early level monster, his damage output seems pretty decent. Design-wise, I also think Kraymine is a considerable step up from Gipsaros. He's still pretty silly looking, but is also considerably more menacing. I find it pretty interesting that his shell seems to have a color and texture incredibly reminiscent of the Blos Wyverns. Hard to say, but I wonder if that's perhaps some form of visual defense acquired through years of evolution. That, you know, perhaps Kraymine evolved to look a little bit more like Diablos and Monoblos to spook potential threats that don't look too closely at him. Uh, that's at least a kind of a neat idea. It looks like earthy battle armor built on top of his fleshy blue hide that you see on the typical Gipsaros. I really like the bright red shock of fur that sticks out nicely from his otherwise desaturated colors, and his brow shape and blood red eyes give him this kind of permanent look of rage on his face. He looks like a properly ruthless and violent animal, while still maintaining a lot of the quirkiness that I really like about bird wyverns. Same with the combat, I think this is a design that takes the Gipsaros template and pushes it in a pretty neat direction. I'd say I'm so far a fan of this desert-dwelling barbarian bird. I think he looks much more interesting, fundamentally cooler, and considerably less annoying than Gipsaros. It's a shame that of the two, this is the one we probably won't be seeing ever again. I like the idea of monsters having relatives, and I think this is a pretty good one. I'll give him a, a 7 for wanting to see him again. Day. Gotta say, this is probably my favorite look into the Carapacians. Bailade is indeed of the same monster category as the crustacean like Hermitar and Cenotar, but has a design much more akin to that of a spider. And the spider similarities don't just stop the design, as Bailade is a creature capable of producing a movement impeding silk. Much like Caesarbur reinterpreted the typical monkey monster skeleton with a rodent, Bailade injects some arachnid DNA into this crap 
crab dominated category. Though to be fair, Bailidae was likely in development before the spider inspired Temnoseran classification was introduced in Monster Hunter 4. He has an immediately captivating design, most notably for his bizarrely developed abdomen, which has evolved to look like the skull of a much larger monster. An adaptation most certainly developed with the purpose of striking fear into predators and competitors. Bailidae himself is a rather successful hunter. He dominates caves and caverns within heavily forested areas, preferring to stick to the enclosed spaces where he has more mobility. He can pretty easily pick off any and all herbivores who wander into his den and can go blow for blow with several monsters of his size. Though he is by no means an apex predator at the top of the forest food chain, he has his own niche carved out where he's a successful and ominous hunter, and he likes to stay where he's the most comfortable. I will say, I think the fight leaves a little to be desired. Caesar Burr and Kramine also didn't have the deepest movesets, but I think they had a bit more personality to them. Bailiday uses his large claws for a lot of his attacks, and most of his claw attacks are just right on in front of him. He has a forward-facing claw slam and a forward-facing claw lunge. He does have a pretty cool punch walk type of attack where he slams one claw after the other into the ground, you know, right in front of him. He doesn't even have some of the maneuverability and odd attack angles that make Hermitar and Cenotar fight so engaging. If you keep out a direct line of sight, you're gonna do pretty well for yourself against him. I'm kinda shocked he doesn't really incorporate his massive abdomen into combat, like, at all. Sure, it can do a little bit of damage if he backs into you with it, but it isn't really incorporated into his attacks, at least from what I've seen. The coolest stuff he can do is with his webs. The best attack he has by far is where he can swing from the cavern ceiling with his silk and come lunging towards you, though, you know, as cool as that is, this too is a forward-facing claw attack. It's just a lot fancier. The neatest thing that he has is the movement-inhibiting properties of his silk attacks. You get hit by these little web traps that he lays on the ground, then your movement speed is cut in half making it much, much easier for Bailey to hit you. This is a mechanic I believe wholly unique to this game, and movement manipulation in general is not super duper common in Monster Hunter, so I think this is a really neat debuff. As I said before, love the design. I think that's absolutely the high point of Bailey Day. He's nice and freaky looking. Your eyes are immediately drawn to that big false monster skull jutting out of his back. I really like the concept of animals having an aspect of their biology built to make them look like a bigger, scarier animal than they actually are. I think it's just a really interesting defense mechanism, and Bailiday has far and away the zaniest interpretation of this biological adaptation that I've ever seen. His abdomen sits nice and high and towers over the rest of his body, letting the visage of a monster skull loom over Bailiday and potentially any other competitor encroaching on the spider crab's territory. When enraged, the abdomen will swell with blood, causing the false eye to glow red. The fact that a creature's abdomen would grow so precisely that a skull-like formation manifested with fake horns and fake fangs and fake eyes, that's a little bit out there, but yeah, sure, I, I like it. I <laughs> it's really fun. It's a real-world concept taking to a monster hunter extreme. It's pretty great. Rest of him's pretty great looking too. He's got this neat creepy spider face with his beady little green eyes and giant buck teeth fangs. I'm a big fan of the attack and defense design of his claws. From straight on, they look nice and big and broad, very shield-like, and from the bottom, you can get a look at these dagger-like blades coming out of them. And to wrap things up here, the color scheme is pretty great, too. He's got a lot of bone coloration and texture for his face, his claws, and the front parts of his abdomen, which kind of sells the concept of him carrying around a monster skull on his back. And as you go towards the back of the body, that color gives way to this mix of dark blues and reds and greens and grays, which look quite nice with the orange highlights on the abdomen's false horns. Bailiday is a concept that I love attached to a monster that I like, and I, I really wanted to love him fully. There's a subspecies that I haven't seen gameplay for yet, as of writing this chunk of the script, who may be able to impress me, but the core Bela Day has a fight that is just a tad too basic. It's very straightforward, very predictable looking, and doesn't capitalize on the massive abdomen, shield-like aspect of the claws, the mandibles, or skittery mobility that the crab skeleton allows for. I definitely still do appreciate the unique debuff though. I do really like the design. 
but I think I'd really want to see more from him. As it stands, I think I'd give Bela Day a seven for how much I'd like to see him in Mainline Monster Hunter. Like Tenna. Even over at Tencent, the lightning monsters are treated really good. Going into making this video, Lightenno was probably my favorite monster in online's core roster of unique creations, and after seeing how this bad boy fights and understanding what he can do, ah uh, yeah, that top spot's gonna be even harder to take. Lightenna is a gorgeous looking blue and golden beetle who can generate electricity via the rapid movements of its wings. Electricity courses through its body with, with a positive charge congregating towards its horn and a negative charge forming towards his abdomen. And the relationships these charges have with themselves and Lightenna's moveset is where this monster really shines. Quite literally, at full power, a Lightenna's light can be seen for over 70 kilometers. That amount of electrical strength should tell you just how dangerous these bugs can be. Most of Lightenna's lightning attacks are positively charged, and when they hit you, your lightning resistance decreases and your stamina usage increases. When you are inflicted with a positive charge, these negatively charged electrospheres that Lightenna produces will be pulled towards you, and should you be inflicted with both charges, you will be paralyzed. This can work the the other way, with you being negatively charged, then positively charged, then paralyzed, but from what I've seen, it's much easier and more common for you to be positively charged initially and then struck with a negative charge attack. A good rule of thumb is that Lytena's positively charged attacks are a bit brighter blue and his negative attacks are a deeper, darker purple in coloration. And unlike a lot of our previous entries, Lytena's packing a pretty sizable arsenal of attacks. Sometimes he fires off his electricity in short range bursts with large areas of effect. At other times he shoots off fast moving long distance pinpoint beams of electricity at you. And other times he can coat his horn with lightning sweeping it at you or charging straight into you with it with breakneck speed. There is no range at which Lytenna doesn't have an option. He can keep you out and punish you for getting in. He can conjure a full body encompassing shock wave of electrical energy. And when he deploys his negative charge orbs, he fires off several at a time, making it much harder for you to effectively dodge them. He's definitely the biggest threat we've seen so far. Fast, strong, persistent, accurate, and his bag of tricks is pretty deep. The fight looks like a really good challenge, and for once, it's the monster who has a resource management puzzle it must utilize to try and make you weaker and create weak points in your defenses. More often than not, it's the hunter trying to exploit a monster's special weaknesses and mechanics to try and gain an advantage, but here, the role is reversed. This plays pretty well with some of Monster Hunter Online's unique AI aspects. There'll be a countdown timer for how long you will keep a debuff on you, and having that knowledge helps inform you you how long you have to be careful about the different charges, giving you a timeline where you should be defensive and evasive so as not to grant light tenor the paralysis it wants to land on you. If there's any issue with this battle, it's that light tenor spends a bit of time meandering about in the air where the only accessible parts of his body for most melee weapons to be attacked are going to be his two little scrawny legs. Uh, that and there's a bit of clipping into the floor. In terms of the design, Lightenna looks pretty excellent. His shape is simple, that being of a massive horned beetle with a sleek body shape and thick armored legs. His shell is colored a beautiful blue that's darker closer to the body and brighter the further it is out from the shell. Extremities like the tips of his horns are a dazzling electric blue. This blue on his shell is blended with a nice dark gold color on the underside of his legs and torso. The colors complement each other incredibly. His wings are a spectacle all their own glowing a brilliant blue and turning a deep violet towards the ends. Now this is some really good stuff. Lightenna has some unique interactions with the lightning element, a beautiful design, and a pretty great looking grab bag of attacks that look tough to deal with in a really good way. I'm pretty damn impressed. I think Lightenna is going to get a nice strong 10 out of 10 for how much I'd like to see him. I like uh, pretty much everything about him quite a bit. Oh, 
Kotaku. Or, as you will see most commonly in YouTube videos and on the Monster Hunter wiki, the Disaster Wyvern. This guy never properly got a romanized name, whereas the other online monsters did, so his official title is what became his English name, uh, that being Disaster Wyvern. However, his untranslated name is indeed Koyaku, and that is what we will be calling him for the bulk of this video. So with that out of the way, wow, this is a weird looking monster. <laughs> monster Hunter Online's original brew Brute Wyvern has officially ousted Frontier's Gasura Bazura as the single oddest thing I have ever seen on this frame, and I'm having a lot of trouble telling if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I do like my weirdo monsters, but this chicken leg walking, thunder thigh having, fishtail swinging prehistoric trigonometry lesson is uh, uh, quite the distinct looking son of a bitch. Koyaku is relentless and brutal, his entire game plan built around speed and aggression. He might be the fastest, most agile brute wyvern out there, and he's got quite a few tools at his disposal. First off, his horn and arm blade shell things are very large and ridiculously sharp. Each one can be a lethal weapon that can puncture a hole nice and clean through armor and the person inside said armor. Second of all, the heat Koyaku produces can generate massive bursts of steam. These steam blasts are so powerful that they can propel Koyaku in different directions, granting him excellent attack speed, evasive capabilities, and momentum. An enraged Koyaku will be rocketing across the battlefield in and out of range of hunter attacks, only to come crashing down at full force onto a hunter that's only barely keeping up. And the ace up Koyaku's sleeve is effectively a combination of the other two abilities. He brings the tips of his blades and horn together and rockets forwards, turning himself into an unstoppable piercing death machine. He can charge several times in a row, and despite this seeming blindness, these charges can track pretty easily. Sheer overwhelming power is the name of the game. It doesn't help that Koyaku can inflict water blight, which of course slows stamina recovery, making evading Koyaku's constant assault much more taxing. His fight is super physical, and though that can often result in a fight that's not too eye-catching, his trademark charges and steam jets add a level of awe to his attacks that allow him to fight and move in a way that most other monsters can't. His triangular rush is easily his most famous attack, but he also has access to tail spins, big haymaker punches, slams, steam back rocket jumps and lunges, and a really cool attack that's kind of like a shield rush where he jets forward and slams into with one of the flat edges of his arm blades. The fight looks like a lot of fun. The difficulty spike in these original monsters is starting to show itself loud and clear. Koyaku looks like a really good challenge, a proper test of reflexes, positioning, timing, and patience. Okay, so looking at his design through the lens of actually watching him fight, I still think there's some proportion issues going on here, but I also think this render does him really dirty. I've known about this guy for a good long while and thought he looked just terrible for a while. Something about his pose or angle really exacerbates design issues that I don't find as pertinent when watching him fights. The legs still seem a little scrawny and the tail's a bit thick, but Taking time to get a good look at him alleviates some of my less enthusiastic first impressions. His arm, shell, blade, covered things look much sleeker, cooler, and more impressive on the outside than they do on the inside, and the main render oddly decides to show you the inside of both. You don't often see them like this. In game, you get what the design is going for. They're sharp, strong, aerodynamic. I also like the more chitinous insectoid exoskeleton texture he's got going on. It's a pretty distinct texture compared to that of other brute wyverns. I really like the small, beady yellow eyes that make Koyaku look like he's never known any emotion besides unfettered rage. Uh, however, I still don't like the legs. Though not as stumpy as I thought, 
they're way too skinny. And although I do like the look of the tail as its own thing, it lacks the chitinous sheen of the torso, and the almost fish fin looking texture on the spikes make it look like it belongs to an aquatic creature. I, I think the look kinda doesn't match up with the upper half of the body. There's a bit of a design inconsistency. Oh, and the, the green with red highlights is a good look. It reminds me of Devil Joe, which I always enjoy. So, Koyaku the Disaster Wyvern. He's a weird one, but he's got a lot of merits. There's some design elements that that would need fixing for me to really love him, but I think the fight looks excellent, and he's got a lot going for him that sets him apart super well from other brute wyverns. Of the monsters I've covered, I think he's got my favorite looking fight out of all of them. Hard to tell, I haven't actually fought him, but it looks fun. See, this is why I love making these videos and why they're worth making. I went into the Frontier videos expecting to find some really cool ideas in a treasure trove of bloated mechanics and weirdos, and I fell in love with, I think, like 90% of that game's roster. Likewise, I entered this video prepped and ready to mock Koyaku up and down for being a big, stupid-looking gremlin dinosaur with triangles glued to his hands, but after actually seeing him... I was kind of wrong. I realized more and more that it sucks ass that these monsters are probably lost media. Koyaku is going to get a 9 for how much I'd like to fight him. How's that for a redemption story? Margle. We began this list with a beaver modeled after Kongalala, and we continue on with a wolf modeled after Rajang. And we also now go from one of Monster Hunter's goofiest designs to goofiest names. Slice Margle is an imposing fanged beast modeled heavily after a wolf, yet utilizing the general frame, stance, and posture of Rajang. Strange that they use the skeleton for a wolf monster when Frontier's Kamu and Noto Orugaran aren't online, though perhaps they were added in after Slice Margle? I'm not certain. If that's the case, that would make a lot more sense. Slice Margle is an incredibly powerful predator who dwells within colds and mountainous regions. Strangely enough, despite his power, high placement on the food chain, and the likely scarcity of prey in this habitat, Slice Margle is a bit of a picky hunter. He's been sighted in harmony with large herbivores like Popo and Enteka, going so far as to even protect them from other large predators. His preferred prey are creatures he seems to deem as worthy challenges. Other large predators like Kezu and Ice Cramine are far more up his alley, and humans don't seem to be exempt from his list of targets. Targets. A predator among predators is a pretty interesting niche, honestly. He isn't competing for the same food as many of the other monsters near his caliber of strength, and the large herbivores Slice Margle guards likely serve as excellent bait for the predators Slice Margle desires to hunt and eat. He's got a pretty unique personality that lets him stand out from a lot of the other hyper-aggressive monsters out there. I think he's carved out a pretty cool little niche for himself. Alongside his raw strength and speed, the strongest weapons in Slice Margle's arsenal are the numerous bladed spikes jutting out of his arms and back. These spikes are ejectable and very easy for Slice Margle to regenerate. Even if his arms and back are wounded, these broken spikes will reconstitute over the course of the battle, making Slice Margle one of very few monsters across the entire series capable of repairing damaged body parts. These parts can only be broken when enraged, and although they will eventually reconstitute themselves, shattering these spikes will buy you some time where they cannot be fired from his broken body parts. And the benefit to this is that making contact with these ejected spikes will inflict the stabbed status. As cool as that sounds, the stabbed status isn't really that bad. It works almost the exact same as Seregios' bleed status, yet uh, somehow seems to do even less damage. I noticed that a lot of his basic physical attacks 
particularly when he's enraged, are very similar to Rajang's physical attacks, but with follow-ups that Rajang doesn't have, which is pretty cool. At least the mainline Rajang, I haven't watched the online Rajang fight. For example, when Slice Margo does these side-to-side -side hops, he'll end it with a turnaround, which Rajang doesn't do. When he does Rajang's diving punch, he'll come out of it with a roll into another punch, and when he does Rajang's spin attack, he combos it into a leap that slams back down hard. Additionally, there's a good bit of similarity here with Frontier's Shutikiki, the both of them having numerous attacks where they'll lunge up into the air and send barrages of spikes shooting down to the ground, leaving dangerous traps for you to avoid should the initial pelting of spikes miss their mark. On top of this, he has some of his own punches, slams, and swipes that are animations unique to him. His fight seems a tad derivative, and I think I'd like to see two, maybe three more attacks that are wholly unique to him. I do appreciate the fact that he took a good chunk of animations from an established monster and retooled almost all of them in ways that make these attacks look pretty fresh. And the spike traps and spike shots add an extra level of flair to some of these moves he borrowed from Rajang. He was able to make a lot of these moves feel like his own. Not my favorite fight that I've seen so far on this list, but I can appreciate some of the innovations being made here. His design's another funky looking one. I definitely prefer him from the side as opposed to straight on. I think this more canine facial structure can look a little odd on a body frame built for primates at certain angles. He definitely looks kind of weird on two legs as well, that's for sure. His spikes I'm a bit torn on. On the one hand, the blue and bone coloration is pretty cool, and I kind of like the shape of his spikes, but they look way thicker and more dull on his body than they do when fired off in his attacks. And more than a lot of other monsters who have armor on their forelimbs, he really looks like he's wearing just spiky gauntlets. Also, this really tall poof of fur he's got going on and the massive crest coming off of his head look kind of goofy from straight on. His color scheme is pretty great though. I really like the long white fur with the black tiger stripe pattern, and the dark blue spikes stand out pretty nicely against the otherwise almost exclusively black and white color palette. Yeah, this design is a little bit of a toss up for me. I really like it at certain angles, I don't like it at others, and like Caesar Burr, I do like this concept of taking the monkey skeleton and branching it out to completely different types of mammals. Slice Margo is a monster with a lot of give and take take to him. I think he's got a pretty unique personality and niche. I'd love to see his behaviors played out in a Monster Hunter title that has a more ecological focus. His design works for me more than it doesn't, but there are aspects that I really don't enjoy. His fight has a lot of borrowed animations, but with follow-ups and properties that keep them somewhat fresh. I think Slice Margle is a good monster, but there's a good amount of weaknesses here too. I'll give him, I think, a high six for how much I'd like to see him in Mainline Monster Hunter. Australian. And we have now arrived at the flagship of Monster Hunter Online. The fiery, the beautiful, the rare, and the enigmatic Australian, the Star Wyvern. Australian makes quite the striking first impression, not too dissimilar from the typical Elder Dragon shape of Kshaladora or Teostra, but greatly elongated and lacking in any wings. That is, until a swarm of large, colorful insects known as star butterflies attach themselves to her hide, creating an elaborate set of winged armor for the creature. Fun fact, Australian is the only community-named monster, and from what I've read, some of the proposed names had a feminine lean to them. 
Tom, insinuating that Australian is female. Heck, one of her official titles is the Princess of Light and Darkness. Additionally, Australian is one of the two monsters categorized as a triple question mark, and much like her counterpart in this category, Gormagala, she is stated to be the juvenile form of an elder dragon. Unfortunately, due to online's life cycle being cut short, we never got to know what this elder dragon was, and we may never know. Australian is quite the odd monster, deserving of her unknown classification. She is rarely seen, not particularly aggressive unless challenged, and dwells in rather remote parts of the world, some so remote that they have yet to be found. Experts aren't sure that they know exactly where Australian's core territory is. Wherever they go, Australians seem to be towards the top of the pecking order, only challenged by the top-level monsters an ecosystem has at its disposal. Even stranger is her relationship with the star butterflies that stay close to her. These butterflies seem to generate their own fiery power, a power that Australian can manipulate and draw upon. They will follow her commands diligently, defending her, augmenting her strength, attacking designated targets, and even de detonating in fiery bursts when flung at an enemy. It's unclear why this relationship exists, though there are numerous theories. It can take quite a lot to rile up an Australian. They're rather calm by nature, and their tendency to wander means they aren't super territorial, but those who do rile an Australian up seldom live to regret it. Okay, so... I'm really rooting for Australian's two variations to do some really cool stuff. Because Australian has a few neat things she can do, but man, I was whelmed watching this fight. Australian has three forms. Her typical form, her armored form, and her winged form. And those first two don't seem to last very long and are almost kind of like borderline pointless. And it might be for the best, honestly, because she seems pretty slow in her core form and her armored form. In her standard form, her attacks are purely physical. A few paw swipes and bite attack combos here and there, though her favorite weapon absolutely seems to be her incredibly long tail whose range will be an issue for the entire fight if it isn't severed. When she takes enough damage, a very cool animation plays where her star butterflies assemble in crisscross patterns, surrounding her until forming blade-deflecting armor across her body. This state reinforces many of her weak points and guards potentially breakable body parts. She's not particularly fast here either, but can shoot off several star butterflies at the ground as explosive projectiles. Additionally, a swarm of butterflies will almost always stick by her. After very little time, Time again, she'll swap to her winged form, and this is by far the coolest state that she has. It's signaled in by the very cool transformation sequence once again, and these glowing insect wing-like scales erupt all over her body, glowing with the flaming energy she's absorbed from the star butterflies. This is the mode worth talking about, and the fight here is fine, but I won't lie, I went in expecting more. She keeps her arsenal of physical attacks from her original state and adds on to the attack list with more spins, tail lunges, and just tail sweeps, as well as body slams, lunges, and charges. There is also the ever-present threat of her calling her swarming butterflies to home in on you and dive at you at high speed. For this attack, the damage of the exploding bugs sounds noteworthy, but I don't think the tracking is too precise, and they don't bombard you terribly fast. I rarely saw them hit their mark during the fights I watched. Honestly, the two biggest things you gotta watch out for are her tail and the sheer speed of her attack animations. Her tail is massive and probably her most used weapon. Severing it can reduce her difficulty quite a bit. Speaking of, what is interesting about Australian's fight is the special mechanics to her horn and tail breaks. These parts can only be damaged in her base form, and for her tail to be severed in her winged form, you must get the initial break in her unarmored state. Otherwise, there is no way to cut the tail later on. When she's at low health, it is possible to knock her out of her winged form back to her base to restart the cycle. However, according to one of the content creators I was watching, you can only get that first tail break and the horn break the first time she's unarmored. Even if you knock her back to her first phase, you can't get those breaks. If that's true, that sounds like a mistake on the programming side of things, because that's a really weird choice. Yeah, man, there's the occasional cool attack here and there. The bug swarm is neat. The concept I really like 
But with the base Australian, at least, it feels like they got in the basic Elder Dragon physical attacks and started to conceptualize her shenanigans with her bugs and armored forms and projectiles, but ran out of time to fully formulate these parts of her. I was a little disappointed watching this fight. I had to watch the battle back like a couple of times just to remember what attack she actually did. I haven't seen her two other forms yet as of writing this, so here's hoping she comes back with a vengeance. Now, the design, on the other hand, I don't think I have any complaints. This is a gorgeous looking creature. She takes the traditional Elder Dragon skeleton and toys with it in her own way, ditching the conventional wings for a sleeker and longer body, neck, and tail. The dark orange and brown scales give her a nice imposing base color scheme and serve as a nice dark base for her, the brighter contrasting elements that we'll get as she evolves. The cream colored spines lining her body look great on her orange scales and aren't overly long or awkward or overbearing. And I love the array of horns she has on her face. Though plentiful, the swept back alignment they share keeps the face from looking too messy. And her facial structure is very traditionally draconic, nice and intimidating and ferocious. There's a pretty cool blend of Eastern and Western dragons baked into her look that comes together really well. There's there's also this fiery substance moving and pulsing beneath her hide, which is visible through these translucent patterns on her torso, as if there's lava burning beneath the surface and fueling the dragon. The armored form isn't too much to write home about, very much the same dragon but with a dark brown solid substance on her horns, claws, and tail. This one's probably her weakest design, I think it especially makes her horns look worse. The winged form is what we're really looking at here. Her render does a decent enough job on selling how cool she looks. This already sick looking wingless dragon covered in scales comparable to those of insectoid wings is a pretty neat image on its own, but it's nothing compared to watching the the actual creature in motion. These insect-like wing structures standing tall across her back, claws, and tail, all glowing and empowered by the flame burning at her core. From a distance, it looks like steady jets of fire erupting out of her back. But up close, you can see the intricate beauty of these wing-like structures. I think this is an exceptionally well-designed monster. I feel about Australian kind of the same way I felt about Bailaday, only with each emotion magnified. I really love her conceptually. I adore the design. I think she has a very cool placement in the ecosystem. She has a few attacks that are kind of unique, but there's also a ton that are just simple. And the concept of Australian really does not seem wholly actualized here. What's worse is the probably lost potential of her final form. Considering her wingless body and clear Eastern Dragon inspiration, I get the feeling we maybe might have seen a final form based heavily on the serpentine dragons of Chinese mythology. Yeah, we've had a few big serpentine elder dragons, but nothing quite like the wise and powerful beasts of Eastern folklore. That's just my speculation, could be complete and utter nonsense, but I totally could have seen that being the reality, and we may never know. I'm gonna rake Australian with Bela Day at a 7 out of 10 for wanting to see her again. I'm sure another pass of this flagship for online could have reaped some great rewards, and like I said, there's two more Australian to check out in a bit, so maybe she'll get the chance, but the regular incarnation of this mysterious dragon just kinda came up a little short. Tartaronis. If I had a nickel for every time a single country exclusive Monster Hunter MMO had a reddish brown sand dwelling turtle monster that fired projectiles out of its back shell like cannonballs, I would have two nickels. Which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened twice. You know what else is f***ing weird? An elder dragon built like a sea turtle that can fly. If you've only ever seen one monster from Monster Hunter Online, it was probably Tartaronis. This magnificent 
oddity is among the most wonderfully bad ideas that Monster Hunter has ever coughed up. Tartaronis is an all-consuming monstrosity that terrorizes desert regions hunting unchallenged and eating pretty much everything unlucky enough to be in its path. He is capable of digging, damn near swimming through desert sands at high speeds, is a decent combatant on the ground, and when push comes to shove, he utilizes a massive amount of hot air created by his body to lift himself up into the air and maintain sustained flight all while broadsiding you with the spikes on its back and creating dust devil tornadoes by flapping his flippers. This fight has a few layers to it. For the most part, you'll be fighting him on the ground where he'll loom over the battlefield propped up on his two massive front flippers. Here, he's got a decent collection of moves, each with their own large windup so you'll see what's coming, which is pretty necessary considering his massive hitboxes and damage. He can lunge forwards, slam his body down, rush ahead on his flippers, make sweeping attacks with the flippers, swing his tail in wide arcs, and fire off several spikes from his back in artillery angles that you can anticipate by watching for their shadows on the ground. For a massive monster, this grounded fight looks decent. The collection of moves is solid, slow, and pretty easily readable, but the hurt boxes are also very vast. And as I said, the damage is significant. It's your typical gives and takes for a giant monster fight in this franchise. We've gotten to the point in Modern Monster Hunter where the big fights on the ground are much better, but this looks like a fairly well-constructed middle point between the extremely passive massive monsters of the first and second generations and the destructive gods of the fourth and the fifth generations. The part about this fight that impressed me the least was when he digs below ground. This portion of the duel looks like it's kind of meandering. It's of a similar vein to that of Ukonlos's ice-breaking shark attack chase that it's feared for, where the massive back of Tartaronis emerges out of the sand and he'll pursue targets from underground, but it just kind of lacks any and all of the urgency and sense of terror created by Yukonlos's famous pursuit. There is a lot of just kind of plodding along here, made worse by the fact that online's quests only have a 30 minute time limit and Tartaronis has a lot of health. This would need to be made much more aggressive and heavily expedited if it were ever to be done again. Now, when this bad boy flies, that's what you're really here to see. And from what I've seen, when Tartaronis takes to the skies, he is a bit more aggressive, has a little bit more room to move around, and can do some pretty cool stuff. But he's also super tough to hit, and you're more or less just trying to bring him down as quick as possible with a Ballista Binder. I think he looks super cool up in the air like this, but the combat here would definitely need some work if it were to ever be reinterpreted. The point of Tartaronis is that he's a gigantic flying sand turtle dragon, but you kind of need to take him out of the air as soon as possible. While he's up there, he's wreathed in a sand aura that can ensnare and entrap you. Flaps of his flippers can kick up long-lasting dust devils that can sweep you up into the air, and he can tilt himself on his axis a little bit and legitimately fire off a bombardment broadside of spikes at the ground like he's a frigate warship. This is wickedly awesome to behold, and perhaps the most impressive display that online has to offer, but the game doesn't really have the tools to capitalize on it, encouraging you to end the fun pretty much as soon as it begins. I adore the concept and the visuals, but it looks like Tartaronis may have been a bit too ambitious. He also looks excellent. He's a gigantic sea turtle with a draconic style to it. I don't I don't know what else you could ask for, honestly. The shape of a sea turtle lends itself pretty well to a flying monster, actually, using his massive fins and tail to steer himself around a little bit as he swims through the sky. It's imposing and also kind of graceful looking. His color scheme is fitting, if not terribly striking. He's got a reddish brown color for his shell with a light tan, nearly cream color for the highlights on his crest, spines, and flippers. It's perfectly fine and appealing looking for a desert monster. I do like the somewhat wing membrane-like texture off of some of his dorsal plates. I couldn't find anything definitive, but perhaps they are additional smaller fins that assist with tighter air control. I don't know. They open up a little bit more in the air, so I think that might be the case. And in doing so, they make him look even larger and scarier when he's up in the air with all those spikes propped up back a little bit more. Pretty sick detail. 
Also serving to make him look more intimidating are the twin points coming off of the chin and the brow. I don't think he'd look nearly as intimidating without them. With the exception of the Snapping and Michael Bay species, turtles are generally not particularly scary looking, so these two massive spearheads coming right for you, threatening to skewer you, are necessary additions in that extra fear factor that Tartaronis needs. I think Tartaronis is an incredible concept found within a game that may have bitten off a bit more than it could chew with him. The sight of him in the air alone is an image that sticks in the mind. It makes you go, Damn, this franchise is bat insane, and I love it. Whenever Monster Hunter Online comes up, Tartaronis is one of the first images conjured in my head. I don't think his fight looks half bad, but it certainly has some weaknesses. I think the modern era of broader maps and enhanced verticality that we're getting into with Monster Hunter games now would have served Tartaronis very well. I really don't think he needs all that much work. The design is excellent, the concept is memorable, and the moveset could maybe use a few more punch-ups, but it doesn't look awful at all. I think Tartaronis is going to get a 9 for how much I'd like to see him brought into mainline Monster Hunter. I think we absolutely have the technology nowadays to make this fight incredible. Murphistophelin. There is one final unique foe to cover in Monster Hunter Online. One final challenge. And at the apex of this charming MMO stands one of the privileged few. A first-class dangerous monster. A peer of the Black Dragons. A feared and revered creature dwelling deep in hellish and hostile corners of the planet. One who invokes the silhouette of the most feared creature in Monster Hunter's history. A living skeleton engulfed in roaring flame and dragon lightning. A glutton who feeds upon the powers of his very foes. The barren disaster dragon, Murphistophelin. It's pretty sick that this spin-off Monster Hunter MMO, helmed by another company, contains one of the legendary forbidden monsters. Murphistophelin is a beast sharing the frame, size, and a few attacks of the almighty Fatalis, and a somewhat similar power set to a Latrion, but I'm happy to report that he most certainly has a lot of his own merits. Murphistophelin has one of the most intriguing methods of amassing power. On his stomach is an exposed core. It is a rather vulnerable point on his body, but the benefits to this obvious weak point balance out the drawbacks. With this core, Murphistophelin can absorb elemental power, strengthening his own body with whatever he comes in contact with. The fire of Arathalos may sting his hide, but Murphistophelin can make that fire his own, and amplify it tenfold. This is an amazingly cool biological asset. A tool not quite like any we've seen before. The unfortunate reality is that this mechanic of Murphistophelin's ecology isn't used in his actual fight. It's somewhat understandable why this is. He'd probably have to live in an environment that had access to several elemental powers at once, or deliberately seek out other monsters to get this up and running, or maybe he could siphon the elements off of hunter weapons, something like that. Those could be some neat ideas, and although this kind of interaction wouldn't be mandatory to make the Murphistophelin fight good, it is a tad disappointing that this aspect of his biology is explored in a cutscene and then never really played with. There's some good room for creativity here. The fight itself, as is, looks pretty damn good. It certainly looks a little slow and meticulous, but not meandering. Starting out, Murphistophelin is a purely physical attacker. He will almost exclusively remain up on his hind legs, attacking using his massive tail, stone slicing claws, body slams, a slithering crawl, and probably my favorite thing he does is where he will run on two legs at you, cross up behind you, and snap at you with his jaws. I, I think there's a reason why Fatalis doesn't run. This looks absolutely hilarious, and I adore it. Given a bit of time, he'll rise up into the air, curl himself 
up and burst with either dragon or fire, randomly entering one of his two modes. Both modes are easily recognizable, so you'll know what you're dealing with. Dragon turns his spikes and glowing insides a dark pink with a sinister fire filling in his wing membranes. His fire form turns all the same body parts a bright orange and lights up his wing membranes with bright yellow and orange flames. In both modes, he has access to a variety of ranged attacks and the ability to fly as his wing membranes have ignited and fully formed. Both states have more or less the same attacks, but certain properties here are altered. In his dragon state, his main projectile is a concentrated draconic beam, whereas in his fire state, it's a spread shot of high velocity fireballs. In his draconic state, his slithering crawl pours dragon energy into the ground, inflicting an automatic stun upon those who touch the tainted earth and in his fire form, he ignites the ground he walks on when he crawls. His biggest attack is a shower of draconic lightning bolts in one state, and a ground-searing flame burst in the other. Very similar attacks, but with enough difference that they don't feel simply like palette-swapped moves. Additionally, he can fire off his breath attacks while flying, as well as dive bomb opponents and sweep the area with his long tail. I like the look of this fight a lot. It feels like a neat improvement off of the original Fatalis battle of the past, with some great aesthetics, a good pace, high damage, and a fairly consistent flow of moveset changes to keep the battle engaging. The design here is pretty darn good too. I especially really like the skeletal concept here. A lot of bone texture and color on the monsters in this game, I'm noticing. He's looking like a walking Fatalis skeleton, incredibly lithe and covered head to tail in an abundance of rigid bone collar plating. I love his membrane devoid wings, the bones of the wings themselves looking like long taloned fingers with almost kind of like a spinal cord looking set of ridges on them. I'm a little iffy on his face. It's kind of hard to place why. It might be the overbite. I don't think it's the downward pointed jaw. It could be the teeny beady emotionless little black eyes. That might be it, honestly. It could be like a mix of things. Maybe I find the lack of expressiveness a little off-putting and the mouth shape a little cartoony. I don't think his face looks necessarily bad, but there's something tickling my brain in a way that doesn't take him super seriously, which contrasts it with how spooky I find the rest of him. I don't hate it, but there's something, I guess, kind of cartoony about it. Also a little cartoony is his exposed purple elemental core with a whole bunch of, like, teeth looking spikes wrapped around it, which makes it look like this evil sci-fi door. I do really like the marks of purple all over his face and his wings and his torso, which will all light up bright with his spikes when he enters his elemental modes. And damn dude, once his barren wings now light up with membranes of elemental fire, that's pretty rad. I, I don't know how you fly with fire for wing membranes, but this is the category of monsters where you can get pretty and ridiculous, so I don't know, I'm all for it. He's got a mix of scary, badass, and goofy, all mixed in a way that I guess none of the other Forbidden Monsters really do, except, you know, maybe Dire Morales with the whole volcano shoulder thing. That's a little silly. I think I'm okay with one member of this super exclusive club having a design that isn't 100% badass all the way through. It's neat to have a little bit of diversity going on in that category. Mephistophelin is quite the finale to the first section of this video. Don't you worry, we have a lot of monster variations to cover. Mephistophelin's a pretty damn sweet Elder Dragon, with not a lot needed to fix him, though I'm sure they could make him more ridiculous if they really wanted to. I'll harp on the elemental absorption thing one more time, though. I think if I could do anything for Mephistophelin, it would be to expand on that in the actual gameplay. If he needs to get his fire powers, maybe he dunks himself in lava. Maybe he could let himself get struck by lightning to get the thunder element. Maybe he lives in a region where the dragon element is naturally produced and he can absorb that out of the ground or something, and that's why he lives in really remote regions. Or perhaps, you know, elemental damage is incredibly effective against him. But if you do enough elemental damage, he can siphon that element out of your weapon and switch his states, altering his elemental weaknesses. And maybe you do a couple of these at the same time. I don't know, make the fight really crazy. I just love to see this idea played with because they show it in a cutscene, but it's not how he actually works in the game. As is, Mephistophelin gets a nine for how much I'd like to see him show up in Monster Hunter. All righty. So that is Monster. Monster Hunter Online's nine original brand spanking new monsters, and we got 
plenty more to talk about. First off, we're going to cover a category of monster variations unique to online alone. A category of monster variations that live in complete isolation from other members of their species and have developed heightened abilities and differing physiology due to their abnormal life cycle. These are the aptly named Lone Species. Kongalala. Deep in the remote woodland region known as the Esther Lake, you may find a species of Kongalala with a beautiful pelt, littered with many shades of bright, brilliant orange, ranging almost all the way to yellow and red, with small shocks of steely blue fur under his eyes and at his wrists. It's funny. What is, I would say far and away the best looking of the Kongalala is the one who triples down on their most disgusting attributes. Kongalala are already a species of vulgar gross-out monsters using flatulence, dung, and belching up toxins from food as their primary weapons. The golden Kongalala not only have larger fart clouds during their attacks, not only seem to have a heightened frequency of using said fart attacks, not only produce a stench debuff aura out of their backsides when angered, but also have an eloquent new combo in the form of a series of repositioning maneuvers whilst flinging a volley of excrement. What a gentleman. He also seems to be a bit faster and more aggressive, using less of Kongalala's long recovery attacks where he throws his weight around. So, I kind of like Kongalala. I think he's one of the first really good silly monsters, and the stench debuff is honestly kind of underutilized and could stand to be a bit more of a legitimate threat if utilized by tougher monsters. I kind of like this guy, plus he's absolutely my favorite looking of the three Kongalala. I'll give Golden Boy here a 7 out of 10 for wanting to see him again. Tepeki and Guren Shen Guren. Now, here's an interesting pairing. Big ol' god crab Shen Guren is in Monster Hunter Online as one of its raid bosses, and has brought along two lone species for two additional raid battles with their own mechanics. Tepeki and Guren Shen Guren are more fiery than their monster of origin, more dangerous, and both wear the skull of an Akantor, as opposed to the Lao Shen Lung skull often worn by the typical Shen Guren. Tepeki and Guren have what is effectively the inverse of the same gimmick. Let me explain. We'll go with Tepeki Shengaren first. So, from what I understand with both of these guys, your goal is to knock them down as often as you can in order to break the Akantor skull shell on their backs for the best rewards. To do this, you have to wound the legs. In the case of the Tepeki Shengaren, his legs are covered in a hide harder than steel, which repels almost any weapon. To knock him down, you need to heat up his legs to make them more susceptible to damage. You can do this with fire traps found in supply drops, with ballista fire, and I believe with explosive damage from weapons like gun lances, and I think standard fire elemental attacks. The cool thing about online's raid battles is that you can bring in larger teams and have a broader composition of weapons. 
Worlds. The strategy here seems to be to bring in a lot of longsword players for their unable to be deflected spirit combo, a few gun lances to heat up the legs, and some hunting horns for buffs and healing. Later on in the fight, at the second phase of the fortress defense, some hunters will need to break off and hold back an onslaught of Cenotar mobs so they can't intrude on the hunt. Though Tepeki Shengaren is slow, you need to be cautious. Stomps of his feet can cause small bursts of flame around him. He can swing his claws down in front of him, he can rear up on his back legs and slam down hard, igniting the ground beneath him, and he can unleash a colossal torrent of fire out of his Akantor shell. Additionally, stomps from heated legs can create some larger bursts of fire. The Guren Shengaren flips this fight on its head. He is superheated and glowing bright orange. Chunks of lava fall from his torso consistently, and he still has access to the Depeki's massive slam and a Cantor flame cannon. With this fight, you need to freeze his superheated legs in order to increase the damage dealt to them. This can be done with the use of ice barrel bombs that can be found on the map, probably ice elemental damage too, I think. So, I can't claim to 100% understand the mechanics of both fights, and I'm not entirely sure what the goal was to have two alternative Shen Guren lone species in online, but at face value, Guren Shen Guren looks to be far superior to Tepeki. Sure, Tepeki Shen's super hardened legs seem to necessitate more creative tactics to deal with his gimmick, but the damage absorption of his super armored legs, the fact that you kind of seem to be punished by achieving your goal of heating his legs by increasing his stomp's blast radius, and the lack of a major design overhaul minus the shell makes Tepeki seem a bit dragged out and exasperating. Guren Shengaren, on the other hand, looks way cooler. He lacks some of the more damaged spongy elements of Tepeki and doesn't make the fight worse when you freeze his legs. From what I can see, Guren Shengaren and pretty much just kind of invalidates Tepeki Shen. I'll give Tepeki like a 2 for wanting to see him in Mainline Monster Hunter, and I'll give Gurren a 7. I'd love to see Shen Guren come back in some way, shape, or form, and if he does, I could see him at least learning some tricks from this incarnation. He still doesn't look ridiculously fun, but definitely the best iteration of this monster so far. Sandstone Basarius. So this is a pretty cool concept. Basarios is a monster typically found dwelling in volcanic regions and has a shell composed mostly of minerals and ores. So what happens if you take a monster like this and have him live in a different environment with different minerals and ores? The result is a Basarios with a shell composed of sandstone rather than volcanic rock. As a result, the sandstone Basarios can no longer breathe or emit fire. However, it can intake and expel vast quantities of sand in a number of ways. This sand sticks to and inhibits inhibits the movements of those hit with it, inducing the muddied state. Basarios can expel the sand from vents on his lower body, sending out multiple waves of the stuff, and he can fire it from his mouth as a beam. Additionally, the sandstone Basarios seem to be much better at digging than the regular species, and can remain partially submerged within the sand while expelling his sand attacks. And of course, he still has his poison and sleep gas producing organs found in the typical members of the species. I like this concept a ton. Monsters having drastic changes in their biology and abilities due to their environment changing is a fun way to make variations, especially with a monster like Basarios, whose very hide is tied to the minerals in his surroundings. It makes sense that being near sandstone would alter his shell's composition and the nature of his abilities. I also think he looks a little bit cooler than the average Basarios. I think I'll give him an eight for wanting to see him. He's pretty dope. Gold Hypnocatrice. <laughs> 
yet another golden loan species, and yet another variation of Hypnocatrice, the eccentric, sleep-inducing bird wyvern. This guy is filled with the same high energy and wacky personality that this species is known for, perhaps kicking it up to the highest level we've seen for Hypnocatrice. He runs around squawking and prancing and charging to and fro and all over the place non-stop. He has Silver Hypnocatrice's dropkick and an attack where he lands so violently that he can hurt his own legs. He can exhale a cloud of sleep gas and land on it hard enough to cause it to expand in several directions. Gold Hypnocatrice's big claim to fame, however, is a similarly expelled yellow gas cloud. On contact, you will receive the drunken status, where you will still fall asleep. But when you wake up, your controls will be temporarily reversed. I'm not sure exactly when Gold Hypnocatrice was added to online, so I'm not sure if this reverse control idea originates with him or Malfestio, who arrived in Generations in 2015. It is kind of cool that there is another monster with his ability, and for that reason alone, I suppose it would be kind of neat to see Gold Hypnocatrice again, just to have another monster with this status out there. He's also got a ton of really goofy animations, and I love how lively just in general Hypnocatrice Hypnocatrice can be. I will say though, he might be my least favorite looking of all four Hypnocatrice. Not that bright yellow looks bad on him, but it's not as grounded as the standard Hypnoc. He's got less interesting colors in the breeding season Hypnoc, and he's not as cool looking as the silver Hypnoc. Okay, he, he's, <laughs> he's better looking than Zenith Hypnocatrice, but uh, that's not exactly the highest bar. Uh, 6 out of 10 for wanting this guy. Flame Blangonga. From the snowy mountains to the mountains of fire, this Blangonga's a long way from home. Out here in the volcanic heat, Blangonga's fur has turned a deep red, his whiskers have turned yellow, his skin has turned black, and he has a long spike of yellow fur coming up off the top of his head. His forelimbs also seem to be charred and burned and devoid of fur entirely up until a bit past his elbows. The hair spike's not my favorite touch, but in general I do really like this recolor for the guy. So first and foremost with the flame, Blangonga. A lot of his major snow and ice attacks have been turned into fire attacks. He can rip up and fling a huge chunk of volcanic rock in front of himself. Instead of his ice breath attack, he can exhale a blast of fire that he can sweep back and forth, unlike the regular Blangonga, who can only exhale his ice blast directly forwards. On top of the physical attacks you can typically expect from a Blangonga, this guy's got a half-decent arsenal of new moves. He can reposition easier with side hops, he can chain his diving punches together, and he can leap up and twist in midair, causing bursts of fire to erupt out of the ground as he lands. The coolest thing Flame Blangonga can do, however, is stuff his hands down into the rock beneath his feet and bring them back out coated in molten stone. These fiery rock gauntlets make his arms nearly impervious to damage, can add fire effects to his punch attacks, and when he's done with them, he can punch so hard that the molten rock comes flying off his fists as projectiles. Big fan of this guy. Most of the recolor looks really good, he works with his new environment exceptionally well, he has a lot of good looking brand new moves both to complement his firing new abilities and independently of them completely. This is an excellent monster variation. I'll give Flame Blangonga a 9 for how much I like to fight him. Gongen Hermitar. I didn't think I'd ever be somewhat intimidated by a Daimyo Hermitar, but here we are. Another resident of the mysterious and secluded Esther Lake, we have a wandering Daimyo Hermitar whose carapace has turned a gleaming onyx black, his monoblo shell has been bleached white, and his claws are now adorned in glittering amber crystal. This dude looks like a menace, let me tell ya. Those crystals 
are absolutely not just for show. The core gimmick of Gongen Hermitar is shredding his targets to death by violently firing off chunks of those amber crystals. Anytime he scrapes his claws together, he's likely going to fire off a buckshot of crystal. He can clash his claws directly in front of him to fire off a straight shot of crystal. He's got a punch walk where he strikes the ground so hard that it sends these projectiles flying everywhere. He can automatically stun you with a shock wave created by his claws slamming together. This guy can slam a claw down, embed it into the ground, and use it as an axis to spin around, launching himself up into the air only to come crashing down, firing off a salvo of arcing artillery crystals every which way. This mother can even jump out of his impenetrable shield and land hard for another crystal burst. And this dude just hurts. Just blocking some of his bigger attacks is going to take some healthy chunks out of that health bar. This guy has mix-ups on a good amount of his original attacks. He's got scary projectiles. He's got combos, high damage, and a fantastic looking design. I... I kind of want to give this dude a 10, which is funny because Daimyo Hermitar is just supposed to be this goofy, low-level little guy. Not really anything all that crazy, but you, you know, f*** it. 10 out of 10 for Gungan Hermitar. I, I want to fight this dude. Oni Musha. From Hermitar to Cenotar, and this one's a little bit of a step down. Oni Musha quite literally translates to Demon Samurai, and I kind of feel like they may have been the slightest bit generous with that. This lone species of the Shogun Sanitar is a much more nimble and practiced combatant than your typical Shogun Sanitar. He also has one oddly formed claw at having a more shield-like shape to it. He's also rocking this new teal color, which I definitely don't like as much as the regular blue. This guy does have a couple of neat looking new attacks. He can double up his standard claw sweeps. He can perform a retreating claw slash, and he has a terrifying double spinning slash attack. The strangest thing about him is that he doesn't really seem to do anything with his special malformed looking shield claw. It just kind of slices like the other one does. I'm not really sure what the point of this design choice was. I will say though, what is cool about Onimusha is his ranged and elemental capabilities. They're definitely the strongest of any other Cenotar. For one thing, he seems to keep his Gravio shell on a lot more, starting with it at the very least, which means he has access to his Water Beam attack from his back a lot more than the regular Cenotar seems to. And the neatest thing about this guy is that he keeps his Poison Spray that adult Cenotars always lose. I bet some of you even forget that adolescent Cenotars have that Poison Spit ability, and Unimusha has a much more powerful version of the attack. With a name like Demon Samurai, I kinda expected a little more. I think Rust Razor is probably still the scariest Cenotar out there. Though, I cannot deny that this guy does some pretty cool things, and keeping the poison I think is a really cool touch for a Cenotar. I think Onimusha gets a 6 for wanting to see him in Mainline Monster Hunter. At the very least, I think there's some good stuff to cherry pick off of him. Flame Tigrex. Yet another Flame Lone species, and yet another variation of Tigrex. Also, he will be the last of our Lone species for the day. We do have a good chunk more variations to go through after this, though. Here 
we have a Tigrex who has made his home within volcanic mountains and caverns. His shell has grown so accustomed to the heat that patches of lava have hardened and now cling to his wing arms and head, and only very specific attacks can soften up the armor of this fiery Tigrex. The skies... He's okay, and I really like Tigrex too. Combat-wise, he's quite the powerhouse. He has several attacks that can rip up the ground underneath him, carving it into razor-sharp rocks. His charges are ferocious. He has Brute Tigrex's massive bellowing roars, which he can sound off in rapid succession. He has this one really neat animation that I like, where if you're behind him, he'll lift up and look under his wing to find you before he charges at you. He has two attacks that can soften his lava armor. For his wings, he has a heavy stomp that will force his claws underground, igniting them and for his head, he has one incredibly powerful fire roar. And on paper, this is a cool gimmick. Not wholly original, we've seen a lot of fire armor before, but it's a cool concept. There's three issues, though. Number one, he does not do these specific attacks very often, at least from the fight that I watched. Number two, his body parts do not stay heated for very long after he does those attacks. And number three, and this might just be myself, I don't think this is a great idea for Tigrex specifically. Making it so that you can bounce off Tigrex's head clashes kind of with Tigrex's core combat design. Interrupting a Tigrex charge with a perfect strike is a rite of passage. You don't with that. Conquering that charge is kind of what hunting Tigrex is all about. It's funny, Flame Tigrex has a little bit of Brute Tigrex, a little bit of Molten Tigrex, a little bit of Grimclaw Tigrex, and a little bit of Diorex. And in the end, the result is a monster considerably less interesting than all of them, four. I still like this animation a lot. subspecies and variants. Alrighty, we got, I think, 15 or 16 subspecies and variants to cover next. Some pretty simple stuff. I'll give them their due, especially if they got something particularly interesting going on. I'm gonna go through this by monster categories in the order of the wiki page. Let's go. So, Ice Cray Mine. Pretty on par with the subspecies you'd see coming out of, let's say, the third generation. Ice Cray Mine takes the explodey desert-dwelling Cray Mine, brings them to the polar regions, recolors them with an arctic sheen, and adds an icy burst effect to his elemental attacks. Icy subspecies are certainly nothing new, but I don't ever really find myself all that tired of them. I think it's a pretty good go-to for new attack effects and re-upping the design. Ice Cray Mine retains his tan shell and blue hide, perhaps with the brightness turned down a little bit and now has icy textures on his wings, tail, beak, chest, and back. Looks pretty neat, but I also kind of think he looks like a Craymine got lost and got snowed on all day. Fight-wise, Ice Craymine is mostly just an element swap from fire to ice, but with a few new attacks and improvements on old ones. He can fire off ice projectiles in straight shots and in arcs. He can cause ice to burst up from his beak slams out of the ground, and he can temporarily fly up into the air beyond the reach of melee weapons and fire down several icy blasts. Nothing crazy here, but nothing bad. I'd give him, I'd say a five, I suppose. One-eared Yangaruga. Okay, so yeah, it's, it's kind of cool that we have a monster who is defined by the fact that he gets into so many fights that wounded Yangaruga who are made more dangerous by their experience is enough of a commonality within the species population that the guild classifies said injured Yangaruga as their own variants. But this is the third one. <laughs> Scarred, Deadeye, and now One-Eared. Good lord, stop hurting this bird. <laughs> I guess I like the green scale tint and red accents on his spines, but I have quite literally seen this before. He doesn't even really have any new moves. He can use Yankaku's arcing fireballs along with his typical straight shot ones, so that's something. Dude even <laughs> loses his balance and stumbles around after some of his attacks. And he has trouble landing after he flies. This, this, feel, this feels like punching down. He is actively the least capable of the three Yon Garuga who are classified by being mutilated. I, I, I guess that's more realistic. Decent attention to de detail. Uh, 
one dread Baladay. Okay, so we're seeing some subspecies that add to a few of the base monsters that I was a little whelmed by in terms of their gameplay. The Dread Baladay is a status supercharged incarnation of our spider crab friend from earlier. Not only does the Dread Baladay come with a new host of web attacks, but he can infuse them with poison and paralysis. These little shocks or poison bubble effects on the webbing will indicate which attacks do which status. He can fire off singular web shots, he can retreat backwards while doing this, he can fire off several webbing traps in arcs in front of him and in incredibly long range trails in front of him. He can also fire off several web traps into the air, only for the webbing to come raining down around him. He can keep up a pretty constant barrage of these status inducing web traps on the ground, necessitating decent awareness of surroundings. However, none of the individual web traps are particularly huge, so it doesn't look too annoying to evade with and deal with these attacks. Just some decent situational awareness. His physical attack roster isn't expanded on all that much, but at least now there's a lot more of his web shenanigans mixed in to keep the fight feeling more interesting. His recolor here is kind of neat, going for a dull yellow for most of the shell and a deep dark violet for the highlights, kind of somnicanth colors actually. I don't think he looks as good as the regular Bela Day, but he does look pretty good. Honestly, if Bela Day were ever remade, I wouldn't mind kind of just making this the whole creature now. The web attacks and physical attacks seem way more evenly distributed, and the poison and paralysis adds some half-decent menace here. Dread Baladay can get a 9 for wanting to see him in mainline Monster Hunter, or worked into the baseline Baladay. I think he definitely still gets some tweaks up in a 6th generation Monster Hunter game, but Dread as he is seems to be a fairly complete vision for what this creature can be. Swordmaster Shogun Cenotar. And here we have a Cenotar who slipped and fell in some strawberry jam and is incrementally more skilled with his claws. In terms of his gameplay, I'm noticing two big changes. The first is that his claws are permanently extended rather than retracted when he isn't enraged. And the other change being that he can cancel his charging claw hug into some of his other claw attacks. Also, he seems to be able to attack in a more rapid succession than your typical Shogun. That's really the bulk of what I'm seeing here, and uh, they're two cool ideas, but I don't think they really justify a whole new monster variant. Haiki, if you just altered the context of this version of Shogun, I'd like him a lot more. I don't think there's enough here to justify there being a Swordmaster Shogun Cenotar. If you put these fight changes on a Hazard Quest Shogun Cenotar, by that I mean like the Hazard Hazard quest monsters in Sunbreak, where they altered certain properties of the moves slightly. I would think these are awesome changes for a more challenging version of a regular Shogun. As its own separate individual, there's simply not enough here. I'm going to say 1 out of 10 for wanting Swordmaster Shogun Sinatar himself being brought in, but I'd love to see these changes made for a stronger Shogun in an event quest like the Hazards. Elemental Boldrome. So, tragically, I couldn't find any footage of this quest. From what I understand, this was an April Fool's Day event quest where you could fight a Boldrome that could be wreathed in a random elemental aura, and if you broke his tusks, he could literally use all the elements at once. Uh, t 10 out of 10. Please, somebody recreate this. Yellow Caesarbur. Okay, so it's Caesarbur, and he's yellow, and he's in the desert, and he uses way more mud attacks. Yeah, it's it, it's fine, kind of something I'd expect out of, like, say, a Freedom Unite era subspecies. He can leave long-lasting dug-up chunks of mud on the ground that can slow down movement, and he can also use dig attacks now, so he's definitely not just a pallet swap. I also think he looks like a lot worse. To compensate for the new yellow fur that this guy has, the yellow stripes on the original Caesar Burr look like they were drawn on with a yellow highlighter. I uh, three. Salvageable, but pretty whatever. Also, how, how's he gonna build dams out in the desert? Ghost Caesar Burr. Okay, so it's Caesar Burr. And he smokes weed all the time, and he, uh, rolls more. And he's a bit more violent, and his roar requires earplugs. P pretty much the exact same thing I said for Swordmaster Shogun Cenotar applies here. There's a couple of neat little changes, and some minor bumps in the toolkit that could be useful for a special event quest Caesar Burr, but doesn't really justify a new monster. I'll give him, I, I guess, a 2, because I like the roll attack. 
purple slice margle. So this guy looks terrifying without the proper skills to counter his abilities. Rather than inducing the stabbed debuff, the spikes stuck in the ground by the purple slice margle deal simultaneous poison and paralysis. And we here at CR Volcanic encourage the use of defensive skills to counter monster abilities. So I'm not about to say, ew, double status. I think double status is kind of cool, a neat threat. The one thing I will say, ew, to is the color palettes. Lavender and bright blood orange is not the best look on the stab happy monkey wolf. The coolest thing about purple slice margle by a landslide is when he sticks you with a flung spike or if he punches you, he can give you the debuff stabbed paralysis, which is the greatest status name I think I have ever heard. This is paralysis on a timer that you can dive through at the right time to negate the effects of. That or you'll just be paralyzed on a delay. Neat premise, very unique Kind of cool that there's some ways to get around it. Kind of easy to shake off, but I kind of just like the general premise, giving you like a ticking time bomb type of thing. I think his move pool is slightly expanded, but I didn't notice too much new about him. The status menace is definitely the best thing about him. I'll just give a 5 out of 10 for wanting purple slice Margle. Crystal Basarios. Kind of weird that we got two brand new Basarios in this game, and neither of them have a corresponding Gravios in this game. Also weird is how Crystal Basarios kind of does nothing crystal-y. Instead, during his charge attack and when he shakes himself, he can lose several small boulders from his back to come crashing down on opponents around him. There's some sense to this, as the rocky shell on Crystal Basarios' back is far larger than your typical Basarios, but it's just kind of odd to have the main gimmick of a Crystal Basarios to be flinging black rocks, and that's that's kind of the neatest and most different thing that he does. He can expel fire gas from his underside like Gravios can and other Basarios can't, so that's that's kind of something. I do like how he looks. The black shell is neat. I do like how the red crystal layer at the base of his shell looks with the black, but it just, it just doesn't seem to have a mechanical purpose. What I do appreciate about this design is the fact that the physical shape of Crystal Basarios is different to that of the regular monster. His shell is far larger. It extends down more to the tail. The vast majority of variations and subspecies do not have any alterations to the actual shape and size of the monster. And I appreciate that here, but I don't know. I'm just a bit confused about the point of this guy. It feels like you could have had a really neat Basarios variant here, but there just really isn't that much going on. Um, I don't know three for this guy? Shattered Monoblos. Uh, apparently, when you snap the horn off a of Monoblos, you throw off his equilibrium and make him spin a lot. Yeah, another variant on here with very minor mechanical changes. He does have the ability to double up on his tail backwards sweep, which is kind of a neat way to bait a hunter who isn't paying attention to approach from behind. And this detail is super minor, but online was made back when we were still in that era of monsters having 60 degree turn angles angles for movement, Shattered Monoblos seems to be able to turn a full 180. It's a pretty small detail, but it's kind of interesting to point out. I do like the darkened shell and a little bit of the orange on the frill and destroyed horn. He looks pretty cool. I, I don't know, 3 out of 10 for a Shattered Monoblos, but hey, while we're talking about him, put the regular Monoblos in wilds, please. Conflagration Rathian. So, a little bit of a caveat. When doing research for this video, I didn't really look at the fights for the monsters who were in online who were also in mainline Monster Hunter. So, this monster, and I'm betting a couple of others on this roster, has a couple of moves on it that I'm sure the regular Rathian in online has, but I didn't really look at the regular Rathian. I just look at this one. So, I'm probably going to be more impressed with Conflagration Rathian in the context of this video than I would have been had I looked at the regular Rathian in online, because for a little bit, Rathian was the placeholder flagship of this game and got a bit of extra flair and some new extra moves before Australian came in and took things over. So all of these changes that I'm assuming are on the core Rathian and on Conflagration Rathian, I'm just going to lump all of them under this banner as this new monster. So yeah, 
I'm gonna have a higher opinion of Conflagration Rathian within this context than I probably would have without it, just to kind of make this little chunk clear. And this fight looks pretty cool. The only real drawback here is that Conflagration Rathian is much more heavily armored than the standard Rathian, so you're at higher risk of bouncing. She's got a number of ways to change up her staple backflip attack. Namely, she can spin herself into the air, roar to stun hunters, and immediately follow up with a backflip. Kind of like what Young Garuga can do, but with a lot more flair. She can angle her backflip a bit to throw off where she's going to actually hit you, which is a neat little alteration to the technique, and she can reverse the direction of her tail whip on the ground, which I don't believe I've seen any other monster be able to do before. She's also got some interesting mix-ups, like cancelling her charges into a tail whip and diving out of the air only to immediately follow up with a backflip. Additionally, she has a much more powerful explosive breath attack than a normal Raffian, and through some method, she can ignite her tail during her backflip and send fire spraying off her tail in front of her. I'm going to assume those are the additions brought by the Conflagration Raffian's specifically. I do like the red decorations on her spikes and spines and the bit of red tinge in her wings, though the render makes this red look a little bit more prominent than it actually is on the model. I think if she were ever to be brought back, I'd like a little bit more into the red. This one's kind of a neat variation, almost like a Rathian fighting style with Rathalos levels of fire and flying power. She'd rank quite a bit lower as an improvement on Monster Hunter Online's Rathian, but on her own, in comparison to the Rathian we're all accustomed to, this is quite the cool retooling of a somewhat stale monster. I think if you kept the main series Rathian intact and ported over Conflagration as she is, you'd have a pretty memorable version of her. And with with some further accentuation on her fire abilities, which would be warranted due to the conflagration nomenclature, I think you'd have a really cool new Raffian. I'll give her uh, a 7 out of 10 for wanting to see Raffian like this. Poikilos Lytena. Here, we have a desert-dwelling dragon subspecies of Lytena, and this beetle continues to impress. He substitutes the gold and blue for near black and a dark pink. I don't know which one of these color palettes I like better, actually. He has traded his positive and negative charge shenanigans with electricity for an arsenal of powerful new dragon attacks and a healthy burst of speed, strength, and aggression. Some of these new attacks include horn sweeps, which leave arcs of dragon lightning in their wake, and a massive dragon element burst that sends out revolving orbs of the dangerous energy. I think I'd rather take unique mechanics over cooler attacks, but only by so much, so I'm gonna knock Poikilos down one point to a 9 out of 10 for wanting to see him in Mainline Monster Hunter. If they ever brought over the standard Lytena, I'd still love to see this subspecies come with him. Infernal Tartaronis. This version of our friendly flying sea turtle is built for online's raid battles, which is pretty sweet right off the rip. As the name would imply, this guy is much more fiery than the regular Tartaronis and dwells in volcanic regions. What's cool about Infernal Tartaronis is that he flies a bit more, and your method of getting him down is a little bit more involved than just shooting him down with a ballista binder, as you do with the regular Tartaronis. There are these explosive chunks of volcanic rock that you need to load up into cannons and fire at him to bring him down. Meanwhile, you have these fiery thunderbugs who kind of just come out of nowhere and will start attacking people carrying the cannon ammo. You'll want to have some of your hunters defending the hunters transporting the ammunition. And on top of that, Infernal Tartaronis is kicking up fire tornadoes that'll start whirling across the battlefield, so uh, have fun with that. For the most part, he doesn't look nearly as good as the regular Tartaronis. He replaces some of the more earthy desert colors with a much more charcoal gray, and his underbelly and outside of his fins are nearly white. However, when he's flying and he lights himself up with internal heat, sending flames coursing through his body, he does look pretty good. Infernal doesn't look as good as the original Tartaronis, and for some reason, perhaps due to the fact that being in a volcano makes him look like he's really trying to be cool, he doesn't quite capture the same awe as the original monster does. However, 
this fight does seem a bit better put together, so I'll give him an 8 for wanting to see him return to Monster Hunter. Elemental Mephistoflin. So here, we have a variant of Mephistoflin who can do everything the regular Mephistoflin can, but bumped up another 3 levels. Along with his fire and dragon forms, this bad boy has ice, water, and thunder now added to his repertoire. Like his fire and dragon forms, these additional elemental states don't add a lot of new attacks, but rather change the mechanics of what his elemental attacks can do. In his water state, he is surrounded by a water aura that inflicts the movement speed down debuff. This is a super neat and pretty dangerous ability that makes a lot of sense for a water aura, like it's trying to weigh you down as you're trying to move around within it and trying to either approach or get away from Mephistoflin, but to be a little bit of a downer, the effect doesn't look very good. Not too sure what you do to make a good looking water aura, but this is, uh, I don't know, it's not it. It looks like it clips super awkwardly through his body. In his ice form, his aura and his ice beams can inflict a frozen status that will freeze hunters in place after an allotted time, and in his thunder form, his lightning attacks now inflict paralysis. I'm of two minds on this guy. On the one hand, I really like all the creative status ailments that are inflicted via his elemental attacks. I feel like it's a really creative way to make a multi-element monster. On the other hand, Though the regular Mephistoflin is pretty derivative of Fatalis whilst doing his own thing, now you have him derivative of Fatalis and even more so a Latrion while, yes, still managing to do his own thing, and that makes him mildly less interesting to me. The fact he has just another monster to be compared to. Additionally, he now has five forms that are all pretty similar movement-wise to one another, and I think that erodes a little bit of the interest I have in each form just a little, as now they kind of start to blend together a little more, as he has five different states, but they're all really not doing that much different. So it's a little less easy to appreciate the differences in each one. At least that's kind of how I feel. But I do really like how each one interprets the detrimental abilities of its elements. Kind of like Infernal Turnaronis, there's some gives and some takes here. So I'm going to balance it out with Mephistoflin's score and give Elemental Mephistoflin a 9 out of 10 for wanting to see him as well. Doom Australian. Okay. So we're starting to improve on Australian a little bit here, which is what I really wanted to see with her variations because I really want to love this monster. This subspecies of Online's flagship discards the reddish browns and fiery insectoid wings for a black and white shell and gorgeous looking dark violet accents and star butterfly armor. When it comes to combat, Doom Australian doesn't seem to have too many differences in her physical attack roster, making this still not the most impressive fight out there, but Doom Australian really seems to improve upon the Star Butterfly concept. Not only do the Star Butterflies seem a bit more aggressive in Doom Australian's fights, not only do they do an absolute crap load of damage, which makes the fight much more intense, but now they can burrow underground and shoot up from under you in a swarm. The better incorporation of the Star Butterflies and that tremendous damage makes Doom Australian look more imposing than the regular Australian even though she isn't doing much different herself. The need to watch your back at all angles to make sure the star butterflies aren't sneaking in, whilst still needing to keep tabs on her, I think makes the fight look a lot more heart-pounding. I'm gonna rank Doom Australian at an 8, a little bit higher than the normal Australian, and hasn't moved the needle too much just yet, but now let's see what the final form of our flagship and our final monster of the day can do. Arbiter Australian. Now this is what I'm talking about. The Arbiter Australian is fast, powerful, tenacious, and boasting a nice, wide, healthy move pool that Australians really been needing. The only step down from Doom is that the Destruction Star Butterflies that Arbiter utilizes are less numerous and less aggressive, but no less strong. They're a little less baked into Arbiter's kit than they are Doom's. Arbiter Australian only uses her armored state and winged state, which is fine because regular and Doom Australian barely even use their base state, so I hardly even know what the difference is anyway. And when she's fully charged, she 
barely even needs the butterflies to be ruthless. She's got explosive chaining bite attacks, burst creating backflip tail slams, massive lunging explosive slams, fiery projectile attacks, a sweeping flamethrower, flaming tail spins in and out of the air, exploding paw strikes, lots of really good looking high speed high damage attacks that combo more easily into one another. This fight looks really cool. The design for Arbiter Australian is pretty damn great, especially all lit up. Her shell is this dark gray color with a bit of dark green mixed in, which looks pretty damn good. And holy when the wings go up and it looks like there's just jets of fire pouring off her body, it looks nothing short of phenomenal. Strangely, though the color of her wings and flames indicate that she would be a fire monster, her attacks inflict dragon blight. I'm not sure why that is. So if Australian were to make her way back into Monster Hunter, you could do a few things. Regular Australian has the best design and coolest personality. Doom Australian has the best control of her butterflies. And Arbiter Australian is the best single combatant. You could roll all of these into the base Australian, or accentuate the strengths of each and keep them separate. One way or the other, this is getting a 9 out of 10 for wanting to see it in Modern Monster Hunter. This is the Australian I was really hoping to see, and I'm very happy to cap this video off on such a badass high note. Ladies and gentlemen, Monster Hunter Online is in the books. Another really damn good grab bag of creatures, abilities, mechanics, subspecies. Online was a whole hell of a lot of fun to research and discover and uncover and really get to know while making this. There's definitely a healthy chunk of issues with it and I wasn't as blown away as I was with a monster quality that was in Frontier. Admittedly, there are some really great concepts in here that absolutely feel undercooked in terms of lore and combat, though that could be attributed to a lot of things. And to be fair to the online development team at Tencent, the standards set by the Monster Hunter developers at Capcom are astronomically high. So though Frontier surprised me more, the monsters of Monster Hunter Online charmed me and endeared me to their quirks and creativity. If these creatures are owned by Tencent, which I 
I'm pretty sure they are, never to appear in another game, never to be purchased by Capcom, never to be implemented into an off-brand title. That'll be a real shame. Now, believe it or not, I do not work for Capcom or Tencent's legal department. I don't know exactly where things are and how things are going to pan out. And the chances for these monsters making their return is not zero, but it looks slim. And if it never happens, at least they got to exist for six good years. At least footage of them and information on them is still up for people to see. They'll never fully be forgotten. And hey, second best case scenario, someone resurrects the servers for Monster Hunter Online, much like what has been done for Frontier and a few other games in the series. I I'd check it out if it happens, you know, flaws and all with online. I love this project. I love this work, and I love you, fantastic people who continue to support these videos and support the channel, whether it's through likes and views and subscribing here on YouTube for free or going above and beyond on the Patreon. Doing this as a means of making a living is a dream that's manifesting itself into a reality faster than I expected. I don't know exactly when this video is coming out, but I'm aiming for this to be an anniversary video set to drop on January 9th or 10th of 2024. Whether or not this comes out a little late, this is my one year anniversary video. A year ago, I was squandering myself, waiting for something to happen to me rather than making something of myself. Not unhappy, but trapped, spinning the wheels, purposeless. So I did what I had wanted to do for a very long time, picked out an editing software and started making YouTube videos. My goal was to hit 1,000 subs in my first year. We're closing in on 5,000. We crossed half a million views. Half a fucking million. So let's set a new goal. 20,000 subscribers by January 2024. This upcoming year is going to be a building year. I have legs under my feet now, and I have a building income. Monster Hunter Wild is looming in 2025, so I have a year to really assert myself. We still have explored a cover in this series of videos. I want to make a bunch more monster highlights. I have an idea for Monster Hunter's 20th anniversary. I have a number of other running series I need to continue. I intend to start working more with the second channel, a project I really want to dig into more this year, and I know what next year's Merry Huntmas and next year's anniversary video are both going to be. In 2024, I'm going to build up my library of works on YouTube. I'm going to dig in deep and commit to making the best Monster Hunter videos on the platform that I can. And I would be honored if you would join me. This has been CR Volcanic or Connor. I'll see you around. Shout out to all the patrons, and special shout out to Nihilus Chimerax, Dat Boy Doin' Ding, and Pico Plush. Thanks a lot, guys.